showed earlier today our research that was in the report. And what we did then was to look at the average numbers then. We, we talked about satisfaction drivers, we talked about dissatisfaction, and we talked about the concepts. But what we also found when we were looking deeply into the cities was that there are very different starting points for different cities. So the idea now here is to go further into our analysis and show a little bit what could we learn from each other, where do different things have an opportunity to actually succeed. Okay? So uh, we talked about the possibility for a huge change coming up, right? Giving the interest in these different services. Sorry, is it okay? We talked about the interest levels in these different services, but also the belief from consumers that this will be generally available in only three years' time, with a projected growth rate of five years. But where will it happen? So if we start by looking into the different cities, we see that first of all they have a different starting point in terms of the satisfaction levels. We have New York and London above 70%. If you have such a high starting point, it's hard to even keep the satisfaction at that kind of level. And then we have the, the other cities struggling a little bit further down. So what I would like to do is to start by what actually impacts the overall satisfaction most, which are the dissatisfaction areas. So let's look into that one. Do you remember them? The child elderly care, the traffic and the communication with authorities, and which one was the worst one? Traffic. So let's start with traffic. And here it is. Uh, the levels of satisfaction from these different main problems that people see with traffic situation. And Tokyo sticks out. I mean, in a city with 35 million inhabitants, you have a public transport system which over 80% of the population think works satisfactory. That is a great, impressive thing that has been done here. And if we can start a little, digging a little bit further into that one and see how the Tokyos were seeing the different concepts, we find something else of interest. So if you look at Tokyo, and compare it to the profile of the different cities. We do see two different things uh, merging. And it's the blue line here is whether you think the vehicle makers would make that particular service, and the gray one is if the public transport authorities would be the one providing the service. And here we see the combination of, even with the self-driving parking cars, we see that in Tokyo people perceive that the public transport authorities public transport providers could actually have an opportunity to bring this to the public. And likewise, when you talk a personal navigator service, people see there's a huge gap here where the public transport providers are even high over on the vehicle makers. So if you think about it, it's not that strange. In a situation where you have to start thinking about mobility in another kind of way, um, you would see public and private transport merging. And we would have to think about the movements in the city in a whole other dimension. Self-driving cars wouldn't be possible to work unless they were in some way slotted into the public transport system so that you could gather information from different sources for all of it to work perfectly together. So if there is one city where we see that the, the, the citizens themselves are ready and foresee that such a future could actually happen, we would say Tokyo is the place to start. So there is a lot of noise with the mic. I don't know if I can make it better. I don't want to bother your ears. Is it okay now? Okay, good. So we move on. The second area of dissatisfaction, which is the child and the elderly care. And here we have Sao Paulo struggling as well as Tokyo. So let's dig into that one. And then, when you go further, you see that Sao Paulo is more or less on the same level when it comes to the citizens' belief that these services will actually happen. But here, Tokyo has a much bigger problem, if I may say so. People do not... Can I do something about it? Put it, put it down. Okay, thanks. Um, people in Tokyo do not foresee these services to happen within the next five years. 
So if there is a problem with the elderly care and with the aging population, the citizens of Tokyo do not foresee these services to happen. So here we have a challenge and somewhere to, to, to really think about how this could be done. The last area of dissatisfaction, which is the communication authorities. Uh, and here, again, Sao Paulo and Tokyo are struggling a little bit. And if you look at the one, which is the gray one, which is actually the communication with the, with the authorities, we see that both Tokyo and Sao Paulo is, is struggling a lot. But then comes the difference. What could be done about this? I mean, if you are in the authorities, uh, and trying to improve the situation, and would like to be better in. It's it's too hard. Okay, so I can just imagine I'm a Madonna, and this is not happening. Okay, great. So I'm trying again. So if you're in the situation, and you are in the government's authorities, and you really want to improve the communication with your citizens, what could you do about the situation? And then, again, very different starting points. Uh, because the Sao Paulo Paulites, or whatever you call them, they really want to engage, they really want to communicate with the authorities and try and improve the situation and have information coming to them. Whereas I would say that the Tokyoids have almost given up. It's a, tough, it's a tough message if you're working in the city authorities and want to engage. People in Tokyo do not foresee that they would use these services even if they were available. <coughs> Let's move into the sunny side, the reasons why you want to live in the city. Uh, the satisfaction drivers are very similar. You see also London and New York here have a consistent high level of satisfaction with all these three areas, right? But let's dig a little bit more into it and start with shopping and where it will happen. And if you look at shopping, do you remember from Michael's presentation, he was saying that clothes and shoes, i.e. fashion, was the most wanted item to be, uh, to be used for these different services. So let's look into that one. And what we see here is that London, the capital of fashion, the trendsetter when it comes to street fashion, for example, maybe street fashion in the future could mean something else if you're going from the London perspective of the Londoner. Being in the streets, out there shopping, you can actually start to engage with the different uh, shopping, the different retailers in a whole other way. Yourself finding where the goods is available, recommend uh, and get some same day delivery. London is then, as you can see, higher on both those different services and all other different players. So work from your strength, I would say, to London. If you look to New York and compare a little bit the situation with Beijing, we get a somewhat disrupted picture, but I can uh, talk you through it. What we can see on this kind of level is an indication that in New York people would trust the individual restaurants to be the ones providing all these different service concepts. Whereas uh, in Beijing you see that the authorities have a starting point where they could actually try and provide some of these services even to the level that the restaurant, restaurant ingredient checker has moved above, up and above the individual restaurants on that particular service. So it's also a question that was asked earlier in, in the day, who could provide these different services? Again, of course, depending on the cultural context, it varies. However, generally, it is from the industry itself that people foresee the services to be provided. And finally, if you move to the leisure facilities, and uh, again, London and New York, a clear message to the industry itself. Start to provide these services. We have a mature user, users of smartphones wanting and willing and looking forward to engaging with the different providers, also when it comes to uh, the mobile interaction. I would say to, to London and New York that if you want to continue to be really there for your customers. You have to think about how you become available and use the mobile space in the interaction with them. So uh, finally, some of the conclusions. Londoners look to ICT for shopping. Restaurant and leisure facilities lead those services in New York and London. 
supporting the overall statement that we had that it is the industry itself that starts to, to read to really start to look at those services. The city authorities could be actually have a position to start from in Beijing. Look to Tokyo for transport. Look at what has been done here and look how ready the consumers are to actually leverage from that one. And then uh, there is a bit of a tricky situation in, in Tokyo and Sao Paulo when it comes to care and communication with authorities. Something to urgently address for the authorities and the caregivers. Okay, so with that, I would like to open up for questions and not only to myself, but actually to all the speakers of this third session. So um, please join me, Rashida-san, Suchia-san. And I would also like to invite Mikkel and Harasana. And there will be uh, one mic for you to, to share, Mikkel and Harasan. And then there will be open questions. And uh, <coughs> if there are any questions, otherwise I have a few myself. For the gentleman. You're thinking, yeah? Yeah? I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm on the spot. Yeah. So we have a question over here and then there. Please. Okay. Uh, Japan's innovation country, but why Japan is not born of out of Facebook, Google and other internet companies? Is sorry, I was just you, need, you want to hear the translation? Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. So who wants oh. to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Vashida-san. Yes, please, Vashida-san. Do you want? Do you want to do it? Yes, of course, you can. You choose, Vashida-san, Japanese or English. Uh, 日本の中で閉じてるサービスが結構たくさんあるんですね。で、先にそれが作られたりすることがあって、そうするとその世界標準のサービスが出てきたときに、なんかそれのが遅れてると思うんですね。だからそのスムースにシフトしないということがよく見
the city planning or business model, uh, a human knowledge that it's a money-making structure, or how to think of a structure for us to live nice. That's what you may think, but society tends to go in an unexpected way, meaning in a way we are harvesting we are making a good soil not business idea but a city planning before that humans desire as to how the desire grows as to which way our desire grows is something we have to think that comes first it's a gigantic perspective in a way so even in Japan I don't we don't know how this house vision is going to be in terms of business model but Japanese people's uh, sense of beauty or technology or the way we live if we can think together with many corporations it's going to be a potential industry so Japanese model is not going to be brought into Indonesia we have to see what potentials exist in Indonesia what kind of potentials Indonesian people have is something it's possible that uh, Indonesia can uh, find out something in the uh, Europeans have not found yet of course we all have different desires that comes before the industry sectors by harvesting our desire unlimited a number of uh, answers will be brought out and then comes the business structure we have to step back all the way so that industry and communications and about people's happiness or new culture in Asia as to how they can emerge all that will come afterwards so house vision is something that we're targeting uh, to do that and we have one more. Um, what is the role of uh, Jim from Hong Kong Office Market? What is the role of the ICT in the new housing concept? Mm. I mean, I think this idea of having a house as a platform for services is quite interesting. And, and if you think about that, there's a lot, if, if your life has a sort of one stable point, maybe it's the house. If the house is physical, or as Harasan already mentioned, maybe that in itself is a social network. So it's a belonging. So if the, that belonging to people is, is kind of the platform for services, of course, ICT would be very much a key player in that setup. Uh, however, if that setup is not only people who were who are, are uh, tied together by marriage or by uh, sort of re being related to each other, but they actually live in a in a in a shared house, for example, then a lot of the ideas behind the current generation of ICT services may need to actually find a new expression. So I think this is a very innovative uh, way of thinking about ICT. And that would be then the role to actually come up with those new services. Yes, we have a question on the microphone. Yeah. Uh, you uh, talked about um, different kinds of sensors being used in homes. Uh, to get information about individuals living there. Uh, this is for their benefit, for their health benefit, or the, for them to be able to access services. But what do you foresee as uh, possible privacy um, implications or challenges around this? Is Here in Japan, do you see any, um, any um, resistance towards sharing personal data. Of course we have that. The weather management maybe. Then you have to have your you have to release okay. 
your data to get the doctor's opinion. So in that way, if you want to get good information, you have to disclose information. That's uh, in a way, both it's both ways. So as to where you draw the line to give permission to disclose. It's not something I should be thinking. It's something that so entire society should be awakened so that it can move towards certain direction. This is the sensor function, so your refrigerator has expired uh, three can of beers. I don't know, though. I'm not aware of it, but cloud sourcing would analyze that and uh, notify me. That's a, an option. Of course, all the products will have IC chips, so the information as to what's in my refrigerator is going to be uh, done by clouding uh, service company. That may know, but maybe I don't want to know. In some cases, I don't want to know those information, even if I want to know as to how I should be informed or if I become ill, I have diabetics. Okay, it's really serious, if, even if I don't want to say that to others, as to how I should be communicated, then I can honestly accept and man, try to control my health. It, uh, information analysis and information com uh, conveyance is something that we all have to think of, that health value is something, uh, health uh, knowledge as to how the society is going to be sharing that the discussion or it's not going to be some specific industry doing that so it's up to the wisdom as to how wisdom can be educated to disclose information uh, is a big challenge for us it's some it's not something I should be saying it's up to everybody so, so you should question how everybody's thinking or where we can verify what everybody's thinking is something that I have in mind. What, what you're asking about, of course, when it comes to privacy and integrity is an extremely important question and it's growing in importance over time as we have all this data around us. And this is something we have followed in Consumer Lab over a number of years. And in a report we released in February of this year uh, called Personal Information Economy, we looked at different kinds of information. What is it that is seen as more sensitive? And of course, health information was among the top factors that you're really sensitive around being spread. But at the same time, we also see now in our transporting work that there is an interest when it comes to keeping a healthy life, of course, that are you're willing to share information with your doctor and so on. So there is this whole combination, as Harasan just said, we have to figure this out <coughs> together. Uh, how can we make this the, the benefits for the individual and yet keep the, the strict confidentiality? Yeah. It's, a, it's a very important I question. Think, uh, Harasan, uh, gave, uh, the Mike? Would, uh, Sorry? I uh, would have a, a very good uh, point there when he mentioned diabetes and uh, the number of beer cans in your um, yes. in your refrigerator. Yes. Do you want your your uh, insurance company to yeah. know that? Yeah. What would be the implications about mm. around keeping too many uh, beer cans and having mm. having diabetes at the same time? Mm. <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then we had a question over here too. Are you right? Generally, what we saw also that from a consumer angle, the important thing is that if you give away information, you have to see that you get something in return yourself too. So it's not sort of the benefit of the company. So the urge that there has to be something for the individual. Yeah. One big question. We've got a European company, Japanese thinkers, and the United Nations here. But <laughs> the world is getting closer in some respects yeah. due to social media and connectivity yeah. and communication. Are business models getting more local or more global? And how would that impact all of us in the next few years? Mm. I think some of the discussion that we can relate back to that we have had today is that when you want to go outside of your own country, oops, sorry, of course you have to understand the, the differences of where you're going. Uh, Vashida san you started talking about this from a Japanese, sorry, Japanese. Uh, perspective. Sorry, Japanese. Yeah. Many companies in Japan, for instance, home appliance companies and auto 
uh, more vehicles have been sold globally in the past. They won, they lost in cases, and what they felt was that the other con the local market was not fully understood. It's something we're finding out now. So the business models are becoming closer is one thing, but even so, it's not that Japan can have just one business model. That's not going to be happening. It's more of a local fit. That's what many companies are uh, feeling and seeing now. In the past 20 years, many, were, uh, many business models were integrated. That's what they believed in, but it did not work. So that's how many companies are feeling now in Japan. So that's a reverse direction. Maybe Japanese companies are going reversely. The point I was trying to make is a company such as Apple selling one product globally, are consumers getting um, more common in their likes and dislikes and use of technology or is it becoming more local? Is there a very different feel in Tokyo as compared to Johannesburg or London? Maybe you want to comment again before I go on. Yeah, I th since we talked about this local fit, mm. I think we should also think about individual fit. Mm. And I think it's a combination. So on one level, globalization goes very quickly. So on one level, consumers or people, we as people, have more and more similar uh, preferences because we have similar, we, we are exposed to similar things. The same uh, type of films and so on. It, it, there's, there's more of that. At the same time, we also still belong in our cultures. So it's a, it's a combination of a, a globalization and a feeling of a local belonging. And for, for that reason, there's, there's not one simple answer to the question. Uh, and I think that the trick here is also, if you think about individual fit, uh, even, even local fit is not a good word for that, because in, in the local community, you will have people who are very globalized in their tastes, and other people who are very localized in the test. However, specifically when it comes to devices versus services, maybe, you know, if you look into the devices here in Tokyo, if you take someone's iPhone here in Tokyo, the device may be similar and that's because you have this global sort of trend consciousness or whatever you want to call that. But inside, the customization is totally different and some of the services are also totally different. So it combines the global sort of trend with the local and of course we're also coming from very different starting points uh, where we see now of course that a lot of the we're going in in the, in the western world from a lot of it being bound to the pc and laptop to being much more mobile and being used to do all these things while mobile with your smartphone and laptops whereas in many other high growth markets of course that is the starting point you never came from anywhere else that's the mobile which is the first interface that you have to internet even so we can also land in it from very different angles, but even also always learn from each other. Yeah? Do we have uh, any other questions for now? No? Okay. I think uh, it is time to thank you so much for joining us here. And uh, I would just like maybe uh, Mikkel and uh, Tsuchiya-san to comment a little bit when we started this work together.